Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussions, news, and interviews presenting the film scene with Ileana Douglas. Ileana is an actress, writer, author, and film historian with a need to discuss movies that borders on obsession. You'll learn the history of movies one great story at a time. The film scene is the deep cuts of movie podcasts featuring movies we love by the people who made them. And now, Ileana Douglas. Well, hello there. Welcome to the Film Scene Podcast. I'm Ileana Douglas. I'm here with uh, Jeff Green. Graham. I can't even talk today. It's all right. I got too much going on. You got my first name right. Interestingly, I often get Greg, like very frequently from yeah. different people. I don't know if I just look more like a Greg, but maybe it's a Greg Brady thing. That's the only thing oh. I can... Oh. Uh, but uh, you got my... Uh, as long as you get my first name right, that's all Jeff. that matters, right? <laughs> like Jeff Green. No, Jeff what? Green. I, oh, you know why? Because I'm looking at Pamela Green. We have Pamela Green on today. Jeez. Okay, let's get right to it. Uh, we're talking about documentaries today. Pamela is the documentary filmmaker of Be Natural, which is um, about Alice Guy Blachet, somebody uh, that's why I'm wearing my Solex. Mm-hmm. This was their, her studio that she started in New Jersey at the turn of the century. But I thought it'd be fun to talk about uh, a couple documentaries that I've seen recently that I really love. One is called um, Sad Hill. It's about these fans, the Spanish film subtitles, about these fans who live in... Um, Spain, who recreate the cemetery wow. at the end of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Oh my gosh! So it's like a documentary about devoted film. Yes, well, it's perfect for our listeners. I'd it, say it, it, it really emotional, really sort of catches you off guard. Wow. And uh, anyone who's a film lover, it made me think again about these places. Have you ever been? I know when I used to live in New York, I. I remember thinking that the Goodbye Girl, that it was really, uh, they used, they shot on 78th Street and Central Park West, Mm. and then everything obviously was in a studio. But I remember going to the outside of the building, and I wanted to live in the building. That was my goal. The two, I'm from Cleveland. The Uh two kind of iconic Ohio film locations are The House from a Christmas Story with the leg lamp. That's about 15 minutes from my home, like where I grew That's up. A good one. That's a good one. And then, um, actually, the prison where they shot Shawshank is in Ohio. Oh, wow. In Mansfield, Ohio, kind of in the middle of nowhere, but that's where they shot. So those are kind of the two big, like, you know, I grew up in the Midwest as just like a doe-eyed lover of film. Yes. And so both of those, of course, I've been to and paid paid homage, as you do. Yeah. Well, I do. I uh, All the time. I'm I'm noting addresses, and uh, there's obviously some great ones in uh, Los Angeles. The Double Indemnity House is still there. There's some good ones that are... Um, that are around another movie along the same lines. It's called Drive In. Mm. And this is about people in Pennsylvania who this drive in's going to go out of business. And again, it's so moving. And these these people that are work, they start they start there. They just work for free wow. and they help this guy out and they restore this drive in. And now it's flourishing. And people like Quentin Tarantino send them films because they couldn't. And it all came about because they couldn't afford a DCP machine. Wow. Yeah, it's that, so they show they show movies. That drive-in culture and sort of that so like good. movie-going culture is so precious. And yeah, it, you know, it doesn't feel like it's quite there. Even I feel like I'm candidly almost too young to have ever really experienced it. Oh, it was it was such a part of the social fabric of my growing up, seeing all those movies. You I'm know, sure. And, uh, and uh, a couple other movies, uh, documentaries. Since we're talking about them. Uh, I just saw the documentary, Where's My Roy Cohen, mm. which is unbelievable. It's really scary. Shocking. Uh, but Roy Cohn was, of course, it's just a horrible, horrible person uh, who did a lot of bad things and was... Um, but they, they think he's responsible from the grave of uh, electing Trump. And you go into the history. He was a gay man, closeted all of his life, uh, never admitted that he had AIDS. He's wow. just a... Really, really dark uh, guy, fixer, New York fixer, and yeah, there he is. Right oh there. yeah, I mean, look at that face. It's just reeks it's out of, of a Brian De Palma movie, yes. isn't it? I mean, you can't. I mean, those are dark eyes. It's just, it's a tragic image. He you know, was. You can see uh, it. He killed uh, uh, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. He oh, he behind was the... that. He was part of McCarthyism. Yeah. I mean, it's just a 
terrible, terrible guy. So anyway, I, I saw it. It's very disturbing. It's very good. And uh, I know it's been out for a while, but if you haven't seen Three Perfect Strangers, that was my favorite documentary of last year and it crushed me that it got snubbed. It got snubbed. Oscars. Yeah, it's funny. Two of my favorite documentaries last year were Three Perfect Strangers, which was unreal. But then also the Mr. Rogers documentary, which I oh, thought was so well made. Also so was snubbed. Good. Yeah. Yes, I forgot about that. Really beautifully I, told. I, I watch I love that on Netflix now there's or, you know there's an actual category for documentaries. Mm-hmm. I'm always going through and uh, definitely and, and shooting different ones um, and then my all-time favorite and I've been I've interviewed her is Barbara Koppel the great Barbara Koppel who did uh, Harlan County USA and uh, which if you haven't seen Harlan County USA is really the documentary that started everything in the 1970s mm. she goes uh, down and she lived with the coal miners. Wow. And again, it started out as, oh, I'm going to do a documentary about the strike. And she became so invested. And in the midst of filming, somebody was actually shot and killed. I mean, it got very, very real. And she is in the middle of all of this. And some people say that her very presence being there is what brought about them you know, winning and getting wow. uh, some of the concessions, you know. Well, we'll have to ask Pamela yeah. what some of her favorites are. Absolutely. We have an amazing documentarian in today, Pamela yes. Green. I know. I can't wait to have her. So we should... Uh, I'll go grab her. And we're going to talk about silent film director Alice Guy Blaché. Pamela is very interesting. She founded uh, PIC, which is an entertainment and motion design boutique. She does graphics. Uh, but her documentary, which is called Be Natural, The Untold Story of Alice Guy Blaché. She produced it, wrote it, directed it, edited it. She's she's going around the country trying to sell it. It premiered uh, as the official selection of Cannes in 2018, and it was at the Deauville American Film Festival, the New York Film Festival, uh, BFI, the London Film Festival, and it's going to be um, released any day now, and it's available on demand, which is where I saw it. So, um, Please have a seat, Pamela Green. Thanks so much for coming. I, lo- I love that you brought your knapsack. <laughs> thanks for having me. Uh, so, the for those of I mean, this is this is the your opening question is uh, when did you first hear about Alice Guy Blaché? Probably after you. Well, because we did, I did the show for Turner Classic Movies, which was called Trailblazing Women, and we wanted to do it historically, so we started at the very beginning, and that's when I discovered, you know, Alice Guy Blaché and Lois Weber. So this was in 2013, and people really didn't know anything about her then, and uh, there was a little bit of, but that's why it's so great to have your documentaries, so many of the photos that you've uncovered or are incredible but um so when did you first hear about her and then what made you want to do the film about her 2010 Mm -hmm. so i think maybe before you yeah um i was at home and uh amc uh had a, a show about pioneering women it was called real models i think it was done by barbara streisand and it had Minnie Driver, uh, Shirley MacLaine, and uh, Hilary Swank, maybe Susan Sarandon. And um, Shirley MacLaine was talking about Alice Guy Blash. Hmm. She didn't even pronounce it correctly. That's how, <laughs> that's how fresh this is. Yes. Because she, she's known in academia, but not to the masses. Right. So um, I stand on, of course, many shoulders. So um, I didn't go to film school. Mm-hmm. And... Um, she blew my mind because this was a woman that was making films. Right. She had her own studio. She was involved in all these aspects, and she had a 22-year career. And underneath my breath, I just said, well, I'm not surprised. But then I got angry about it a little bit because I felt robbed because my lens was actually not with women. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, I grew up with Spielberg and... Mm -hmm. Indiana Jones and uh, Scorsese. Of course, I knew about women, but not so early. So um, that's when I became uh, somewhat interested and then obsessed. And the quest, the quest of uh, nonstop began. <laughs> Did it surprise you? Because it surprised me in watching the film how much 
uh, material there actually is. It's just that it was hidden. That's what blew me away. You think, oh, well, it's, you've always, you know, you think, well, I'm not going to really find anything. You found photos uh, of her directing. Uh, incredible. So tell me about that, because part of the movie is a detective story. And, and, I mean, it just must take incredible resilience to cope in cans and call people that most of the movie is you calling relatives of hers. And, and a lot of coffee. Yeah. Um, well, it was interesting because I didn't go to film school. So um, I didn't know anything about early cinema except for what you grow up with, which mm-hmm. is, you know, Charlie Chaplin. And you see Mary Pickford a little bit. And you see these names on buildings when you're driving around L.A. But growing up, I knew nothing except for the the minimal stuff. So how do you take on a task like this? You just have to kind of go back and backtrack and search on the internet. And lucky for me, the internet was there. You Mm -hmm. know, all these people that did work before us. So I contacted John Simon, who had written a book and had done, uh, uh, curated uh, Alice's films at the Whitney in 2009. And she kind of knew where all the dead dead bodies were in academia. And... um, I wasn't interested going that route. I wanted to find out new material. Mm -hmm. And I was told that I was never going to find anything. Mm -hmm. And I was discouraged all the way that you're never going to find any films, you're never going to find anything, what are you doing? Um, So I just started looking at her papers and I just started calling people and, um, you know, I'd prank people. Uh, when I was younger calling, so I was I already had to practice. <laughs> and I cold called my way through Hollywood starting out anyway. So I was like, what's the difference? You know, do you have any papers, et cetera? So I wanted that journey to be in the film because I went in as a civilian and I walked out as a filmmaker, really, because I learned how to make a film through this. But I wanted the main audience to understand what goes on to try to find these different things, how you have to put the threads together. Yes, it's detective stories. I've watched a lot of... Colombo, Murder, She Wrote, et cetera, and was very inspired about following through and see where it was going to lead. I knew I was going to find stuff, mm-hmm. but I'm, I have an obsessive personality of like perfectionist. I just don't know when to stop. Right. So that's kind of why we have a lot of stuff. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. The, um, so one thing, uh, is, she was famous for so many things, but she had a phrase, you know, in her studio, which again is in the movie, beautiful, it says, be natural. And this was her, I guess her uh, way, this is how she wanted actors to perform. So to talk a little bit about that and the importance of that. It's, I, I watched an interview that you did with Jodie Foster, too, where she was mentioning how, in terms of the form of acting, it wasn't melodramatic, it was you know, to be natural. Absolutely. Um, I think one of the most important things for me was, okay, she's the first female filmmaker. She made one of the first narratives. She has all these, like, trivia things about her. Right. But is her work really good? Yes. And, right. you know, that's when I, I watched uh, The Ocean Wave that you're very familiar with. It's yes. on the Women's Pioneers uh, DVD. And I uh, fell in love with that film, and I watched a lot of her French films. So then when I saw the films, I was like, wow, she's really an amazing filmmaker so early, but they're so universal and contemporary in some aspects. Not knowing about the, you know, I knew she had the sign, but not knowing how important it was to her yet, because mm-hmm. I didn't see her on camera talking about it. So naming the film Be Natural Again, I was told, oh, that sounds like a feminine product. Why would you do that? <laughs> oh, my God. So uh, you have to ignore, ignore, ignore. But um, that is the essence of, of her and what directors even say today. I mean, even when I'm directing people for a commercial or whatever I'm doing, I'm like, you know, just do it more natural. Like, right. just be more naturalistic. People don't even realize how much we still use that. And that is so special at a time where everything was overacting. And it's such an important component in the grammar of Mm -hmm. cinema that she contributed to. So you mentioned that she made one of the first narrative films, which is The Cabbage uh, Fairy in 1896. And when we were doing Trailblazing Women, even, it was, well, is, you know, and in all of my research that I found, I said, I think we succinctly need to say it is the first narrative film because up until that point, People were using film to 
you know, show just people doing, people leaving the factory, you know, um, everyday tasks, scientific experiments. And why that is so important is that it's a narrative story. She, although, because she's such a, she was such a modest person, she doesn't take credit for that. She says, I really think the Lumieres are before. You know, yeah. they did a film with the hoses, et cetera. She says, I want to be the first woman who made the narrative, and I did make it in 1896, et cetera. So I'm going to go with her as one of the first. Yes. I think it's pretty advanced, and being one of the first already is amazing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't want to be beat up in an alley by some historian. Because, <laughs> you know, they're, they're well, waiting for me, I know. <laughs> well, why not? Because, again, the whole essence of the, of the film is that how she was left out of the credit, you know, all the history books, because, again, of this tendency that women have to uh, downplay uh, their accomplishments. So that's one of the most important things I wanted to talk about in the in the movie and it's really heart-wrenching and it's again so much of the re research I did and we tri we did our show it started in 1896 and then we went up to Catherine Bigelow winning the Academy Award and the story was basically always the same how women would do work and then be fired how women would do work and their notes would be stolen and so it's a heartbreak the mo for me personally the most heartbreaking part of the movie is when she's innocently when they're doing a history of Gavant and here's all my notes <laughs> and then they took all of her notes and cut her out of the history i i can't imagine how devastating that must have been I, it was awful for her editing it when I was editing yeah. the film and I was watching it because I always thought of the structure as kind of like a princess bride the people that are asking questions in the film and they're kind of like Fred Savage and then what happened so then we would answer through either Jody narrating etc but when mm -hmm. I was cutting it I was like I just I, this is hard to believe because it was just painful to watch it happen even though I knew but on the positive part uh, she is being written back in every day. There's, yes. there's an article every other day about Alice, wow. thanks yes. to this film. Um, and Eisenstein, uh, uh, the specialist on, on uh, Eisenstein's work, is uh, crediting her yeah, for that the was film. Yeah, that was another great little moment. Yeah, so he's, he's adding her in there. So she's slowly getting back in. I wish she were here to see it, but, you know, we're, we're documenting it, we're recording all this stuff, and it's going to pave the way for other women who were not documented and recorded to get their due as well. I think this is definitely, by bringing the story to the masses and taking her, can't take her out of academia completely or out of silent cinema, but I kind of pushed her a little bit to the masses so she would be more popular. Another thing the movie does is focus on a lot of her comedy shorts, which is something I think when we did our show, the, o the only films we, ha we had available were The Ocean Wave, uh, life and uh, you know, birth, uh, birth and death of Christ, and um, falling leaves were the ones, and so they were dramas, and again, seeming more social issues, which is important too. But you have all the comedies. She's hilarious. She's yeah, so funny. I mean, the sticky woman. It's mm -hmm. like unbelievable, you know. And then the drunken mattress. You have a whole new audience looking at it today, like, oh, that's me in college, you yeah. know, trying to get the mattress in the dorm. I have to ask, like, yeah. so we've talked about The Cabbage Fairy. We're talking about these new comedies. It's scary enough to make a film. It takes a lot of courage to get on set and start performing and acting. But at the time, there was no precedent for this. So I'd have to imagine it took so much courage for her and her actors to be doing this type of thing because there really was no precedent for it. Well, nobody cared because they didn't see the value. Right. And one of the reasons why she's one of the first people to also deal with locations is because they couldn't afford the sets. So they wow. would get used sets from the Lumiere brothers. She would get like hand-me-downs, but she decided to go do stuff on the street and she would negotiate with the police, you know, officer, et cetera. It's hilarious. Wow. I mean, it's very similar today with permits, et cetera. But she didn't look at the, the problems. She looked at the possibilities and ignored the obstacles, which mm -hmm. I think is amazing. Also, she was such a raunchy director. I like that you focused on that in the document in the documentary. It's really kind of inspiring to see, you know, typically f women are asked to tone it down or and repress maybe some of those instincts, but she really leaned in. And, and the thing is, she was a Catholic, so it's like, 
Really? Wow, you have a really interesting launchy side to you yes. that you're telling through, you know, cinema. Yeah, it's a, I'm a repressed uh, Christian as well, so that's, <laughs> that's always how it comes out, right? Uh, yeah. She also had a very interesting, problematic relationship with her husband, which, again, in all of my research, every woman <laughs> that seemed to have a kind of a problematic relationship with their husband and then the husbands somehow would get a lot of credit for movies that she did the the huge surprise in your movie was that he left her for lois weber i know that was tough because i found that another silent film d- director. yeah yes. and actually she learned from alice because she yeah. was an actress on the the set of the talking early talking pictures that they called before the jazz singer but uh it was a secret that I knew, and there's, you know, Lois Weber experts, et cetera, and I was interviewing people, and I just couldn't say anything, and I felt so bad because it's like I need to keep it for the film. But um, her, her life is very much a Greek tragedy. Yes. It's really interesting. You know, I, and I was in um, uh, Pittsburgh. We had Lois Weber Day. I mean, so it is great. Now she's got a marker, and uh, I interviewed Shelley Stamp, who's part of the Kino Lorber, and so we were talking all about. But I didn't know the thing about the the uh, the husband. Um, but... Shelley Stamp didn't know either. <laughs> wow! I interviewed her, and I couldn't tell her, so I felt a little bit. Oh, that. that's funny. You see what you're finding out. I think it's good to find out all this. You know, the more. But it was all there. The thing is that... You have to create a, a narrative for it. Yeah, the, pa- the, the her papers, you have to really look. Mm-hmm. And like even when I went to the Academy originally, I think they showed me one photo of Alice and I had a couple of books of her at the Academy. So I asked to look at Luella Parsons' papers. And they said, why would you even want to look at that? There's not going to be anything in there about Alice. Well, how do you know? And of course, I'm wow. using it in the film. So yeah. It's not just about the searching, it's fighting people off with a stick to try to convince them to look at the world differently from what they've been taught until now. I think that's the number one issue, is that we have such a narrative of uh, D.W. Griffith and Cecil B. DeMille, and now even, uh, to me, a couple of the uncomfortable moments in the movie are when you're talking to Peter Bogdanovich, who wrote movie, who wrote film history, and even he has a kind of a reluctance, like, well, our movies weren't really very good, so that's why they're not included. And and that's not even really true. And then when you show him the film, he says, oh, that's very funny. Oh, he like, loved... that was an interesting... He, he loved uh, uh, her stuff after yeah. he saw it. After yeah. he saw it. Yeah, but he was upset that he... He's like, I've written all these books, and I've never really... I've never heard of her. Because he, he worked on so yeah. much of that period. I mean, he just made a film not that long ago. We were at Telluride together. He had done The Great Buster. So, you know, how do you explain these things to people that she's completely, like, non-existent in the books? So, I, I, I mean, I doubt Not my, anymore. I, I mean, and how does that affect the filmmakers of today? That's always the question. Well, here's the wonderful thing with Be Natural. Uh, people thought that nobody would ever see the film so first you know you have to make the film right uh then you have to get it out there the the movie is still playing theatrically in some places it's streaming it's on dvd i get an email probably two or three a day from universities changing the curriculum wow oh, i have great. gone and spoken to the schools yeah and the you know young boys and girls and they're like oh my god i love the editing i love alice and she did this and she did that so She's being introduced in a whole new way, and she is inspiring mm-hmm. for for girls that they can see her and they can be her, be her. But also from uh, men and, and boys to know that the beginning of cinema is a shared gender art. Mm-hmm. It's it, you know it's not just men at the beginning, and the Academy Museum is going to have an area for her. Uh, my funders are raising funds for a pillar for her there. So I feel like in uh, in America, she's definitely, we've done the most, you, yeah. know, you included. Um, she's finally getting distribution in France, you know, Be Natural. Mm-hmm. And it's playing in Australia, Sweden, oh, slowly. So I think as time goes by, she's going to be cemented as a key figure uh partially responsible for the Yeah, the for cinema. her style. Because in the, and again, when we started the show, the amount of movies were very limited. By the time I did the Kino Lorber, 
I'm like, wait a minute. Well, they're more, so, like you said, more of these movies are coming out and painstakingly and they need to be found, restored. But that's what makes it fun. Um, some of the revelations, not just with her, the color tinting, mm -hmm. the use of special effects, it blows your mind how modern it is. And all we've ever seen for a hundred years is, you know, going to the moon or the, you know, we've seen the same and we thought that was magical. Yeah. We have to change you know. the lens, et cetera. And that's, you know, people critiqued me on my editing and that I didn't show her films, uh, long enough in the film, but I didn't know what home these films would have after I finished the film. So my funders paid a lot of money to preserve and restore the films that were already identified, but they weren't available to be seen. So I wanted to show as much of her body of work as possible so people could really understand how much this woman has done. Like the Empress, for example, was sitting in the French Cinematheque for years because the inner titles are not all in there. Who cares? Let's show mm -hmm. the work. Let's show the shots. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, the, you talk about Tinted. Um, William Moulton Marston sold his first script. He's the creator of Wonder Woman. To Alice Guy Boucher, she made a film called The Thief. I only show it a little bit because I didn't have time. Otherwise, I would have to explain the Wonder Woman thing. But it's transferred as tinted, so it just needs a score, and wow. people will be able to see it. So that was the goal, was to educate Hollywood, mm -hmm. change history, and to show as much of her work as possible. She made about a 1,000 films. Is that that's sort of what we're thinking? But how many are... So when I started, um, there were 135. There's mm -hmm. now 150. Wow. Uh, but they weren't available to be seen. Now, right. because of uh, Be Natural and me pushing mm -hmm. all these archives and, you know, the donors, amazing donors to pay to restore, most of those are going to show up on, on DVDs. Right. That's amazing. The And where is, I'm wearing Solax. Where is Solax? We were talking at the top of the, you know, I love to visit uh, places and movie. Where where is Solax? It's in New Jersey. It was in New Jersey. It was in New Jersey. Unfortunately, now it's a grocery store on oh, Lemoyne okay. Avenue. But there's a marker there, and I think oh, they're adding good. more stuff. Oh, and, good. And um, I think they're going to do be doing something special also in November. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go to uh, the T Neck Film Festival. Jodie Foster uh, is going to be coming as well, and uh, it's going to be good. Uh, and I have to ask you, how did you get Jodie Foster, who has a killer French accent? I mean, mm -hmm. She's the, 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 spot on. Well, uh, she studied French at the yes. Lycée Français. So um, uh, Joan Simon, uh, who co-wrote the film with me, we were having lunch, and it was the first time we met. And I said, oh, i got to find a really good narrator, et cetera. And she says, you know, what about Jodie Foster? And I was like, oh, my God, I just saw her in that very long engagement. She speaks fluent French. I'm an idiot. <laughs> and coincidentally, my day job is I do opening credits for films. Mm -hmm. And I almost was going to work on one of her films, but it didn't work out. And uh, the person, I said, hey, can you just introduce me to uh, her people? And as soon as I emailed her, she replied right back. And she's like, well, I think I could be a narrator. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she came over immediately narrated the trailer and then I didn't see her in person for five years and I was terrified because I had never edited before I didn't know what this was going to become and I would send her cuts and I sent her the recorder and I was like oh my god she's gonna I would hide, hide under my desk and I'm like did she email back yet is she does she like it is she gonna work on it and she loved it it was at the time two hours and 45 minutes but she recorded her voice. It matched my terrible temp um, exactly. She's a perfectionist. She's also a filmmaker. So I got that in the package. She would give me advice, but not overstep. Like super respectful, extremely intelligent, talented. I mean, how lucky mm -hmm. are we? How lucky is Alice, too, seriously? Mm. <laughs> I know. And the, the, and that That's the most exciting thing is that you think... Because in her lifetime, uh, she she died without really receiving any recognition at all. And her husband went on to, that really was, that's that part's painful. But Manola just, Manola Dargis from the New York Times, there was an article for, you know, they're publishing obituaries for unknown uh, 
women that never had an obituary. Oh. So a couple of weeks ago, Alice got her obituary wow, for that's the great. first, and it was so beautifully written. So if you guys haven't seen it, you should check it out. So she's this woman. When I go up there one day, I'll be like, look. If you're happy or not, you should like really be grateful because <laughs> we all put in the work for you, lady. Yeah. Oh my, I, I, I'm. Were, were there anything that I, I, that surprised you? I mean, you found well, another thing is you found you found her address book. That must have blown you away. What were some of the <sighs> spoiler alerts for people who haven't seen it yet? Um, relatives finding relatives. You know, people said, Just... "What'd you put the phone calls in there for?" And I said, "Because I want people to realize that." You know, this is how you find people, but right. relatives um, and how she was on point and everything that she said matched up. Like I, I was going by what she was saying because she, she her memoirs were published after she died. But everything she said, I searched and it was accurate. Mm-hmm. And for somebody in her 90s to be telling you these things in her memoirs and then it checks out, she was not a liar. Right. Unlike many men. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened to the notes that she gave uh, to Gamont? Are they did they come back to her ultimately? Because they yes. didn't. She she so she gives them notes of everything that she's done for the company, and they say thank you very much, and they use the notes, but they don't. Well, that's not his fault. The journalist decided not to do that, and then the people that were doing the book, because I think Gamont did give her the opportunity to start out, so he kind of gets a bad rap because. It's not completely his fault. Um, the notes were used by so many historians to write the story of cinema, but they got the credit for writing the story of cinema using her notes because she was the longest surviving yeah. person from, you know, witness of early cinema. Did they did they just not think that the movies were going to survive so that they didn't place an importance on them? They thought there was no future, and um, they didn't believe her. She didn't have the films to show that she did the work. Wow. And everybody else around her was dead. And also, they lied. You know, this one guy says that he made the cabbage fairy. Right. Or he was the guy who made the drunken mattress. He's the actor in the mattress. But, you know, so it was easy to lie back then because there was no way to check. There was something, uh, I don't know if, you, again, I'm doing my research uh, for our other show. Mary Pickford was the first uh, person to get an on screen credit because before that they didn't even have credits. They just had the movie. Mm-hmm. So, but people wanted to know who she, who she was, and that's how credits began. Mm-hmm. So I could see why anybody could say, Yeah, I did that. The director <laughs> title didn't even exist. Yeah. So that's also like when we see films that have the Solex logo, like on your shirt, we know that's made yes. at her studio. And we know that most likely it's something that she worked on because she was the head of the studio. Mm-hmm. But in Gaumont, it's kind of hard to tell. But also, there is nobody else in those years. So who else could it be? Right. Yeah. Gaumont is not directing anything. We know that. And we see the footage of her directing on set in 1905. Thank God that was a promotional video for the uh, new studio of Gaumont that was being built. And she's there directing. So we have that as evidence that she's actually directing. At least we see that in 1905. Yes, and that's one of her epic uh, films, which we showed. That I mean, it's a, you know, they they it's were doing musical. epics and uh, yeah, Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, I, I, again, I think that's one of the most surprising things is that they weren't just like little short right. movies. They were she also, did everything. Well, also yeah. the poster was found. The picture was found two weeks before I got accepted to Cannes, and that's her on set. All those pictures about her directing the Life of Christ did not exist mm-hmm. before. Two weeks before I got accepted to Canon, I was busy licensing that. So that's more proof of her directing in the French era. Wow. There's another movie that she did, uh, uh, The Ocean Waif. And one of the things I thought about The Ocean Waif is it's almost like the first romantic comedy (laughs) because the idea is that this girl is living in an abandoned house of the guy. And it's like, again, it's sort of a meet cute. She she's in an abusive uh, family, so she hides out in a house, and it just happens to be the house of a wealthy, handsome guy, and you know they end up together. And and also that's Doris Kenyon, who was married to Kenyon Sills. I found him. I didn't put that in the film because you can't put everything in there. But he was one of the founders of the academy, wow. so he had oh. all the papers and stuff. So I 
took all the containers and we donated to the academy. Otherwise, stuff is just sitting in basements, etc. I think we've kind of taken care of business pertaining to Alice about how much more we can find. Yes. Material-wise, but I think more films will be found. Great. Yeah, that's the ex- that's the exciting part. Um, so we're talking at the top of the show, favorite documentaries. Do you have, I mean, now that you've, this is your first film and your first documentary, do you want to do more? <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> Um, I give my all, so I have to be very passionate about something. Alice, she was wronged. I believe in justice. I had to correct the record. Um, I I love a lot of documentaries. I think Searching for Sugarman was great. Mm. Um, I mean, there's so many. Um, I think it's a great way to learn how to make a film because there's no script, really. Um, My next project is a narrative, and it's based on a true story. Uh, But I've been talked to about talked possibly into another one but maybe <laughs> it's not as complex as this but i need to kind of do a narrative in between mm-hmm. because i'm still going to research stuff etc but i just uh i need a break and it can't take 10 years <laughs> it is amazing to me you had no editing experience before this this is a well-edited documentary i mean i do a little bit of editing here at the network but nothing like what you've produced and you know we have multi-panel frames coming in and out and you know, a lot of our listeners are film nerds. What was that process like going from zero editing experience to editing a can accepted documentary? Well, it's funny because I get put down a lot for my editing and in, in Be Natural. So thank you for You're liking welcome. it. You're welcome. I thought it was well edited, yeah. Um, I edited it for a younger audience. Um, I don't like things drifting into eternity, going nowhere with silence. Um, my day job is short form. I do opening credits for films, uh, work on trailers, etc. cetera. So... Um, Nobody really could understand what I was thinking in my head of how to structure the movie as a detective story and the bio narrative with Jody. So it was a lot of um, experimentation. Uh, but once I cut one section with with Jody narrating the detective and it all worked, I'm like, okay, this is going to work. Um, a lot of hours on my ass <laughs> every day 4 a.m till 11 p.m wanting to throw the drives in the garbage yep. love hate relationship with avid um <laughs> crying calling joan simon and all my funders i can't do this i don't think i'm gonna make it and uh it got to a point that when we got accepted to can i had to cut in 500 graphics and I went to sleep and I woke up with my hands, my arms just like straight <laughs> out because I was in so much pain because I ended up editing the remainder of it on my kitchen um, table. Wow. Because I, I moved everything into my house after we got accepted to Cannes. It was just insanity. So my advice is to other editors, watch other things, but follow your instinct. Story is the most important. Mm. And... Um, Find people around you that can see your vision and enhance what you're doing instead of, you know, saying, well, you know, you don't know about this. And then this uh, editor doesn't know about that. And da, 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 da. that's all noise. Do the work. Do the work. Find people who are as um, passionate as you and, and you'll get it done. And Walter Murch actually was somebody that I talked to. I don't know if you know who Walter Murch is. Yeah, I do. Okay. So he was the only one uh, of all editors, and that shows you, that liked what I was doing with the film, and instead of um, poo-pooing it and saying, no, do it this way, he looked at the ingredients that I was using to make my cake, Mm -hmm. and he said, well, maybe less cinnamon, maybe less this, or do more of this because this is really good. And it was really encouraging to have somebody from that caliber to give you advice and to support, you know, just completely just me contacting because I'd worked with him before for my day job. So you just have to find people that just see what you see and and that really are passionate and want to help you. Mm. So that's my advice for that. The uh, the last thing I wanted to ask you, just because, the, as you said, the movie is, uh, well, it, is it playing independent cinema? Yes. So theater? basically, how can people um, see the film? They could see, see it on VOD mm-hmm. or they can buy a DVD. Uh, it's coming back to LA at the Arclight November 3rd. Um, so it might be eligible for an Academy Award? No, because oh. what happened was last year, 
I submitted it because um, my distributor wanted it to come out in August. I see. And that would have been now, and I would probably have ripped my hair out. <laughs> <laughs> I was ready for the film to come out, yeah. and so I gave that up by doing that so the film would come out sooner. It was supposed to be March, but they moved it to April. That's okay. We don't care. We just wanted the... I didn't make the movie for an Academy Award, personally. I made it because I wanted Alice to be famous again. She was already famous way before we even knew about her. And I wanted everybody on the planet to know about her and to change history. And I think that's the most important thing. But we're eligible for other awards. But awards, it's very political, you know, and, and it's campaigns and money, 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 money. We have only been surviving through social media and it's actually worked really well we have a big facebook you know instagram twitter etc and um people will find her they keep uh discovering her so we're excited and there's uh you also you have a fund to help restore films yes so um i'm starting i haven't like it's not fully fully done but it's Mm -hmm. alice guy blaché foundation and that's to continue to help um um, restore and preserve her films to continue to get her out there. Wow. Oh, great. Did you kind of feel like Alice through this process? You know, you have the sticks chap- the chips stacked against you as well, and you're being told by people, this is your first documentary, you won't make it, you get accepted to Cannes. Do you feel like you were using her almost as an inspiration as you put the film together? She had such conviction when she was talking, when she was being written out. Um, I felt not just responsible f- to do this for her, but to all the people that donated and believed in me along the way. And the movie went not just to Cannes. Cannes, Deauville, Telluride, New York, mm-hmm. London. It's 96% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's New York uh, Times critics pick. I mean, this movie has better reviews than some of the like big movies that are out there it's just it has no marketing and advertising so how are people going to know about it and they assume it's just silent cinema so we we have a documentary about silent cinema a woman who speaks french it's like suicide (laughs) but once they see it then it it only takes one person like i i would go to the los feliz three um and two people were in the theater and that one person wrote an amazing article in France, and that helped us get French distribution. Wow. So I don't look at it like that, but yes, um, it made me angry because I don't like the word no, and I know that it's not a terrible documentary. I know that we did something that's important, and change is hard. Ch- you know, this is not, it's changing the perception. There's so many chips stacked against besides just making the movie itself. It's like you have to make. Schools change the way. You have to make movie theaters decide that this movie shouldn't just play at noon when mm-hmm. nobody is going to go see it. So I had to do all these things along the way to change, and I hope that that helps future filmmakers for sure. Mm-hmm. The uh, Do you think there should be... I always thought there should be... A, you know, there's movie cinema things. We, we did the Trailblazing Women show for three years. I always wanted it to be a permanent show because how many, when you watch the movie, I guess, I mean, the way I always think is like, how many other Alice Guy Blachets are there wow. now? You've, it took you all this time to do her. But did you see I'm in the, in the film when yes. he talks about Metropolis, instead of restoring that, you have like 60 women. I, I do that like three times because yes. there's all these women that Jane Gaines uh, discovered. Oh, by the way, for the Academy Award, there should be an Academy Award named after her. It should be the Alice Guy Blaché Award. Mm. Mm-hmm. So that should at least happen. They should do something this year, the Academy, seriously. Something for her. Well, we, 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 uh, I've been bemoaning since 2013, the AFI Top 100 has no female uh, directed films. And zero. It's, and it's zero. And, and they're it's, saying it's because the films weren't good. No, mm. it's because they weren't seen. You right. know, because the whole feed on, on Twitter... And you're like, what are you talking about? They had no distribution, probably, and nobody saw them. Same thing that happens today. So, yes, there's so many women that are not recorded or documented. And not only should there be this award, but 
money needs to be put in to give these people faces. Well, the issue is that, again, very much like her time, the people behind the scenes, it's usually, you know, nine male female, male filmmakers and one woman. And so all their movies are on the AFI Top 100. And, uh, you know, if no one is there to defend or, or advocate for... They're making changes with the AFI. I know that for sure. They're changing. Um, they're going to be changing the list. Good. So uh, they they have to. I mean, the the Kickstarter for this being successful and all. I mean, I know it took me a long time, and Kickstarter people want to kill me, but just it being in the air, I think, has had an effect. I, this movie and this work that I did is part of the change. But here, here, this is what this is my issue though is that we do a show, right? And and then they go, okay, well that's enough. We we we've handled female filmmakers, and and for us women and historians, people are like, no, 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 it has to be constant. It can't be, yes, here's the here she is, and that's the end of it. You, it, uh, that's what I find. We've got this window now where people are interested in silent cinema. And the uh, same thing with Aquino Lorber. People were shocked. It won the New York Film Critics. You know, same thing. Every, nobody thought that anybody would be interested in a box set of silent filmmakers. And it's one of the most popular Well, know, I think it's titles. part of Be Natural uh, pushing that forward as well. Because when Be yeah. Natural, the Kickstarter came out in 2013, it was successful. It just shattered. Like, what? You yeah. Know, so... Slowly, everybody, you know, your contribution, what what I'm doing, what Joan Simon did with her book and the exhibition at the Whitney, everybody keeps contributing, buying tickets to female-directed films, supporting other filmmakers, uh, finding a way to support other female content. It, it's going to get done. Mm -hmm. And more preservation, too. Much more preservation. The... But I think it's, it's just exposing the masses because... You know, Hollywood's like high school. If it's if it's cool, everybody talks about it. So now, like all these people in the film, a lot of them didn't know about Alice, and purposely I interviewed them and showed them the work because now, like, oh yeah, of course I know about Alice Guy Blaché. Mm -hmm. So they're like a little commercial for me yeah. and Alice. So the more people that see the film, the more shows like this, the more we continue to do things. I th I think it it might not cement a hundred percent like the future of other women, but I think it's definitely moving in the right direction. Other people need to take the baton. Mm. I'm, yes. reti I'm retiring from my part a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. I've never... There are so many filmmakers that I've discovered, you know, in the variety. There were women film directors doing westerns, mm -hmm. you know, in 19... Well, she did westerns, it, too. She did westerns, too? She's almost fiction. I mean, she's, like, doing... Directing on horses and stuff like that. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to believe. Like, she's, like, unreal. But it's not just women in cinema. It's women in the arts. Yes. It's so many industries across the board. And I heard Brad Pitt talk in an interview this morning for his film, and he says we need to recalibrate the mm. relationship between men and women and how we're looking at the world. And mm. that's what it is. This is all recalibration. Thank you, Brad Pitt. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we were in in the beginnings of cinema. It was that way, I think, because the common goal was just to make movies and be creative. And then the do, do you go along with the theory? Because I don't really know. Uh, um, uh, Carrie Beauchamp thinks that uh, that it's because the Wall Street came in, and that's why they took all the films away from the women. Oh, absolutely. Anytime in any industry, when something become became viable the men would take over because it's like, okay, you know, you go back to where you came from and we're going to deal with it. Mm. Th that's been happening in so many industries. And it clearly, Steve Ross says that from USC, it clearly uh, did happen. When Wall Street came in the front door, the women were shoved out, you know, and not even editors. I mean, it was just, it changed dramatically, mm -hmm. dramatically. But there were so many women at the beginning. There's another film, um, Gina Davis uh, was the executive producer. It's called This Changes Everything. And she thought when Thelma and Louise came out that it would change everything. There would be more right. roles for women, etc. It's really, the actresses, that's one thing. 
but it's it's not just women directors. It's the women cinematographers. Mm. It's there's so many roles behind the camera, on the set. I was on a set not that long ago. It was predominantly male, and it shouldn't be that way. It should be mm-hmm. mixed. It's ridiculous, and it, sh- it should get to a point that it's not about the gender anymore. That you look at a piece of art. It doesn't matter who made it, but there needs to be equality. And we need to fill in the holes with the unknown so we actually get a real picture of cinema. Well, that's the thing with the AFI list that I always talk about. And I always suggest movies that could be on there, you know, uh, The Piano, uh, A League of Their Own. Mm. But it's, it's not even, you know, it's the question of distribution as well. Because if you're making a film and you, it's not going to be seen, what's the point? There needs to be funds uh, or grants for women filmmakers mm. so they can get their film out so it can be seen because a lot of the main audience doesn't know about AFI. They don't know about all the things that we know that we learned along the way to educate ourselves to be able to talk about these things intelligently. But the masses, more stuff needs to be pushed to the masses so it's available and it sticks and then it can spread. And that's why I think Be Natural is, is working slowly because I pushed her to the masses and made her more accessible. Right. Do you think uh, this happened with me uh, many years ago with uh, Barbara Loden? I you know, discovered the Barbara Loden film and again, nobody knew about it. And I was pitching it all around like, you got to release this movie. And nobody took me seriously. And then we talked about it on Trailblazing Women. And then one day you see, you know, it's because I, you, like you said, you be, be cry. I said, she should be there alongside Cassavetti. She wrote it, she directed, she started. And then one day you hear somebody saying it and you, you say, okay, well, it's, you know, it, it's, it's worth it now, but you have to kick and scream. Yes. And, and also, you know, it's not even just about women, it's diversity. You know, look at what's happening in the landscape. A lot of things are changing. I think it's great that Ava DuVernay, she has her own movie theater now. She's showing African-American films. So important. And so, they're making money, too. That's the other thing is yeah. people are shocked that Black Panther was the highest grossing film of last year, one of them. But if we can start to learn that, God forbid, people want to see this content. People are paying for it. That's, that's the change that's so important. Finally, people are recognizing that. Yeah. But it, you, they're not going to have a chance, uh, an independent film, if it's booked in only 21 places with no marketing, no advertising, two days here, let's show it at noon there, and bye. You know, yeah. that's, that's not... So the old ways, like I say in the film, of making movies aren't working anymore. The whole... Um, model and formula i was just at tiff on a panel talking about this we have to make new formulas they're going to work to be able to get these voices seen and heard Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it's silent cinema or new fresh female uh, voices telling stories or transgender or asian or african-american there needs to be a platform for these people to one is to make it but the most important part is to get it out. And I think if we can work on the getting it out and um, making it seen to the masses and critics, there's 600 new Rotten Tomatoes critics. I mean, we had to contact the whole alphabet originally because <laughs> we had an amazing, we had amazing uh, press for the, for the theatrical. But after that, I wanted to make sure we were certified fresh. And we did. We, I'm, I'm not kidding. We contacted the whole alphabet. And that's how we got certified fresh because like, oh, my God, I can't believe I didn't see this film. Shameful. You know, it should be fair and it's not. So we need to all these. These are the things that I think are going to make a big difference. Yes. All righty. Well, hopefully after this, uh, everybody will see uh, Be Natural. They should. You did a great job. It's uh, fascinating and, uh, you know, very, very moving. A very ultimately, again, a very moving film because I think it it always has resonance mm-hmm. with an artist that works that hard, and then is in her own lifetime has to just see that her work is dismissed and she's not going to get any recognition. So, uh, very moving film. And thank you so much, Pam, for thank being you for on, having the, me. on the show. As I always end the show, I say everyone's life is like a movie with the beginning. A middle and an end. And this is the end of our show for today. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Well, thank you so much. Club producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network 
We would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network.